Hello and welcome to China Tonight. I'm Stan Grant. On the program, partnerships in the Pacific, why China is making deals in the region. And Brendan Wan goes wine tasting Chinese style. A lot of people just wonder if China produce any wine at all, um, which it does. So China is a wine producing country. But first tonight, what's making news on the platforms people use, Weibo and WeChat. And joining me is Yvonne Yong. Yvonne, there's been an outpouring of shock and grief at the crash of a China Eastern Airlines flight this week. Hi, Stan. After two decades spent investing in improving China's air safety standards, the tragedy has the public distressed. The plane was travelling from the southwestern city of Kunming to Guangzhou in the southeast when it suddenly plunged nose down into the mountainous area of the Guangxi region, killing all on board. I want to know the truth. At the same time, I'm scared to know the truth, said one person on Weibo, while another complained safety awareness always comes after the accident. Authorities will be relying on the recovered black boxes to find a cause. Victims' families gathered alongside rescuers and officials at the crash site over the weekend. While relatives of those killed have been provided with support, there are also reports Chinese authorities are closely monitoring them and their engagement with media. A claims process has also begun for families. A dedicated team has been set up to handle the process and the total amount of compensation could top a billion yuan, Stan. The airline China Eastern and its subsidiaries have grounded all their 737-800 aircraft, according to Al Jazeera reporters in China, saying it was a precaution. Crystal Jung is an associate professor in aerospace engineering and joins me now. China's aviation regulator has ordered the whole industry, all the airlines that are operating this type, mm. the same type of aircraft, um, to ground uh, the, um, the, uh, the airplane uh, for two weeks for a very thorough comprehensive check before they will be released to be able to fly again. China had a history of, of aircraft incidents like this in the past, but a lot of work has been done since then. Is this raising concern, though, now more broadly about the industry? I don't think so. I think actually um, in the last two decades, and especially after the um, the, the 2010s um, air crash, uh, which uh, happened in Yichun City in Heilongjiang province, um, so uh, the CAC and the, the aviation industry in China has uh, maintained a very good um, safety record that was about more than a decade of safe operation. Um, so I personally, I don't think this raised the concern of the safety. However, having said that, I think safety has always been the priority of the whole industry, regardless whether it is in China or in any other places. So in the past 10, in the past decade, CAC apparently has made significant efforts in ensuring the safe operation of the whole industry. At the same time, they maintain the growth of the air travel industry. So even though this is an accident, so I don't think they would raise the concern, even though from the government perspective, they want to make sure that they, they would not, uh, you know, repetition of this kind of accident. Crystal Zhang, thank you. My pleasure. China's biggest COVID outbreak since the pandemic began has continued this week with parts of Shanghai going into lockdown from today. Yes, millions of people are still in lockdown across the country. For some, the situation has been alarmingly sudden. In Zhengzhou, this woman ended up spending a recent lockdown in her favourite hot pot restaurant after she lingered in the store a few minutes longer than her fellow diners. The doors shut and she was stuck inside. People online were jealous. I'm confused whether she is considered lucky or unlucky. As a person who wants to eat hot pot every day, I want to be isolated here. Well, hot pot is good, but it's not all endless hot pot. Obviously, the rolling lockdowns and rising COVID numbers are having an impact on people's well-being in China, like everywhere else, Yvonne. 
Yes, academic Lu Lin posted that COVID-19 could have a negative impact on people's mental health for the next 20 years. The Chinese Academy of Science author said hundreds of millions of Chinese have been experiencing insomnia. It struck a nerve with around 120 million people reading the post. And that's interesting, isn't it? Because the crisis does appear to be shifting long-held attitudes around mental health. Jinghua Chan has taken a closer look at this issue for China tonight. The pandemic has been a wake-up call for all of us to pay more attention to our mental health. And in China, it's helped to highlight something that used to be shrouded in shame and secrecy. It's normalized seeking help. One of the um, biggest things that impacts mental health treatment, especially access to treatment, is um, the level of stigma. During the Mao era, mental illness was written off as a weakness or delusion, an imaginary affliction for people who just needed to toughen up. That stigma persists today, but things are changing. And in the past, is China has this idiom, Jia chou bu wai yang. Uh, you don't want to um, tell other people what's bad happening in the family. And I can definitely see that start to shift. At the peak of China's coronavirus outbreak, more than a third of respondents in a nationwide survey reported psychological distress. Mental health became a hot topic, and a wave of new counselling and support services followed. There were art exhibitions, TV shows. Even musical theatre has helped bring conversations about mental health out into the open. But it's not a totally new phenomenon. Investments in mental health research and services have led to a massive reduction in suicide. Only a few decades ago, China had one of the world's highest suicide rates, particularly among young rural women. But now it's lower than Australia's. The public system is, is quite well run and quite well, well funded, um, but it does present certain challenges specifically with mental health in that um, the mental health encounters are usually quite brief. Yet while mental health care is improving, China is still understaffed for professional help. There are only 2.2 psychiatrists per 100,000 people. Australia has more than six times that number. Drugs and hospital stays are arguably overused, while quality psychotherapy is harder to access. I think right now China has a lot more um, different variety of services available in public sector, the NGO sector, and funded by the government. Um, the downside of it with all these experiments is that sometimes it can be very confusing, chaotic. Part of that confusion comes from the rapid growth of the sector and disreputable services exploiting anxiety for profit. <laughs> In 2014, Yanzi successfully sued a conversion therapy clinic that attempted to change his sexuality by giving him electric shocks. Yanzi says these services increasingly target young trans people who are coerced into treatment by their parents. There are even cases when LGBTIQ people have been forcibly detained in psych wards by their relatives. While the mental health law of 2012 bans involuntary treatment unless someone is a danger to themselves or others, there continue to be reports of people being committed for all sorts of non-medical reasons. From political dissent, to personal grievances. Like Dong Yao Chong or Ink Girl, who spent more than a year in a psychiatric facility after defacing a poster of Xi Jinping. But a medical lens has limits too. Ways that we have uh, perhaps promulgated a very Western idea of what it means to be ill, especially mentally ill. I do hope that um, Chinese classification systems will move, and not only Chinese ones, but ones around the world, will move more toward indigenous understandings of what it means to experience difficulty. 
China has some unique challenges when it comes to mental health. Rapid change, intense pressure to conform to social expectations, and rising inequality and isolation can all contribute to stress. Chinese folks traditionally have conceptualized difficulties in a much more integrated way, in which we do not separate the emotional from the physical or from the spiritual or from the social or the community. Maybe that's another lesson from these troubling times. You can't isolate your mind from your body or from the world around you. The outside gets in somehow. And Jinghua Chan joins me now. Jinghua, take us through the biggest challenges for mental health in China right now. In terms of uh, public health care, one of the biggest challenges is that in China, public health is really centred in the hospital system. So to get health care, you tend to have to go into a big public hospital um, rather than you know, maybe seeing a GP uh, who's more familiar to you. Uh, so that's a really big challenge for someone who's, uh, you know, maybe feeling unwell to uh, be, you know, kind of exposed and um, walk into a, into a hospital waiting room and uh, sometimes it can really take the whole day before uh, you can see someone. And then in terms of the other services that exist, um, so for example, counselling hotlines and uh, peer support groups, they're just quite variable uh, in quality and in the training that counsellors have. So it can be a little bit hard to navigate uh, for mm. someone who's not familiar with it. Jinghua, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Dan. Yvonne, a trial date has been set for Australian journalist Chung Lei, detained in China, but no more details about her case have been revealed. That's right, Stan. The hearing's due to take place on Thursday, but as with every stage of this since her arrest, the details are unclear. The former high-profile TV anchor for China's English-language broadcaster, CGTN, has been held in Beijing since August 2020. She's accused of providing state secrets to foreigners, which, if convicted, could result in years in jail. Although the trial is expected to take place behind closed doors, Foreign Minister Maurice Payne said in a statement that Australia has asked that his diplomats be permitted to attend the trial. And a leaked draft security arrangement between China and the Solomon Islands has prompted a wave of alarm in Canberra. Yes, but Beijing insists its security cooperation with Solomon Islands is normal and consistent with international law. Under the terms of the draft proposal, China could station military personnel in Solomon Islands to assist in maintaining social order. It could also send warships to the islands, which are only 2,000 kilometres from Australia's coastline. The story was met with alarm among Australia's government in opposition, but China says that reaction is irresponsible. Yvonne, thank you for that. Thanks, Dan. Daniel Suidani is the Premier of Malaita, the most populous province of the Solomon Islands. It was officials in his office that leaked the draft agreement last week. He joins me now from the Solomon Islands. Premier, it's good to have you with us. The Australian government says that it was not surprised, it was not blindsided by this agreement. Is that the way you see it, though? Uh, in terms of the agreement uh, with the Solomon Island government, the way I see things, uh, we, we haven't have any external threat from outside countries so that we need another, you know, uh, security force from outside because we have been uh, in the Pacific uh, staying with the New Zealand and Australian government and we are, you know, they, they look after us. But with this new arrangement, uh, for me, it's not, it's not quite uh, safe uh, the way I look at it for our people because it's new and, and people uh, don't see any other other threats externally that they need to have these people coming to look after the Solomon Island. Prime Minister Sogavari, though, says this is a sovereign decision that he is making as the leader of the country and that this is an agreement that has mm -hmm. economic benefits for the Solomon Islands um, and that acknowledging China and acknowledging China diplomatically has 
uh, has benefits for the Solomon Islands. Is that not the case? Uh, I think uh, even if it's a diplomatic relationship, there are other issues that uh, the government need to consult the people of this country before making decision on it. So the way they, you know, approach or get into this agreement is not uh, is not well. You know, people are not well aware of, and this is a very big issue, uh, and people should be uh, well informed of this thing before the government can do it. Because even if it's a bilateral agreement, uh, the, the power given to the, the members and the, the government is from the people. Where does this lead to, in your view, this agreement? What, what, what is the ultimate end game here? Well, in terms of the ultimate aim of this agreement, what I've seen is uh, for myself and the government of Malita province and people, what we have seen is that the so many things that the DCGA government has been doing uh, without consulting the people. But uh, what I've seen is the communist uh, system is uh, slowly entering into the country. Premier, just, just finally, we've already seen unrest and violence. We saw that last year. Australian troops were called in as well to help quell that. Is this what we are likely to see more of in the future? Do you fear that we are going to see more of this unrest? Well, uh, the recent unrest and even the past unrest that experienced in the country before is all about uh, uh, the government uh, doesn't listen to the people. People are trying to uh, to get uh, what they want from the government or maybe discuss or dialogue with the government. But then the government then uh, davies in, uh, to the people of this nation. The government itself doesn't want to listen to the people or even, you know, discuss and uh, talk with the people about their concerns. Premier Sridhani, again, thank you for giving us your time. Thank you. Matthew Wale is the opposition leader in the Solomon Islands and he joins me now. It's nice to have you with us. You were in the parliament just today. What was being said about this security deal? The Prime Minister announced in a statement on government business for tomorrow that he will be making a statement on the uh, proposed memorandum of understanding with uh, the People's Republic of China tomorrow what, morning. What, what do you expect to come out of that statement? Uh, I don't expect anything new that hasn't already been said. Uh, the government issued over the weekend a statement uh, basically saying that uh, this is one of a few other security understandings that they will be, or uh, agreements they will be pursuing with partners. How is it being received thus, thus far? There must have been a response from, from the public um, to what we've heard over the weekend. What is the, the mood at the moment? Um, there, I think, um, ambivalence maybe, uh, slight confusion, but uh, general fear uh, as to what this all means. Um, and I think also some uh, in the public uh, feeling that uh, he's not, uh, or the government's not giving due weight um, to the benefits that Solomon Islands have had from Australia, New Zealand and the region. And of course, it does raise questions about where this ends up. And you said there's some confusion about what this all means. What does it ultimately mean? Are we seeing the beginning of an increased security military presence by China in the Pacific? Are we talking about a forerunner to a Chinese base there as well? Where does this lead, do you think? Well, firstly, I think it's important to note that there is already an agreement for assistance to our police. So, therefore, this agreement is not about that. Um, it's, I think, also important to note Solomon Islands has never had, nor I don't think will have, threats from external forces. So this is not about Solomon Islands' um, external security environment. Um, so I think one would have to conclude that this is, um, you know, some of the issues in terms of support to our police, but I think predominantly this is um, China's attempt to um, to have reach into this part of the uh, Pacific. Is it not also about about sovereignty? Because that's what we've heard from the Solomon Islands that this is this is good for the Solomons. That that closer ties with China is going to mean is going to be good for the Solomons' economy, and that this is. 
a sovereign decision made by a sovereign state to pursue its own interests? I think it's a very simplistic argument. On the surface, it all sounds good. Uh, but this is a government in this and other matters that has gone beyond its mandate. Um, uh, and it, this is a government that's trying to postpone elections by a year. And I think they're looking for some external support for that because they, I think they expect that there will be some pushback or perhaps even a, a backlash from the public against the, uh, the proposal to postpone elections by a year. Um, and so I think this is all timed um, to conspire um, against any public backlash. Mr. Wale, what does it say as well about the increasing big power rivalry competition in the Pacific? Of course, the United States and China, but what does it say about Australia's role? And is there a perception that Australia, the US and others are not doing enough and that countries are going to look elsewhere, as we're seeing not just in the Solomons, but elsewhere in the Pacific as well, looking to China? I think Australia is doing a lot here. Um, question of whether it's doing enough. I think they're doing a lot. Australia, New Zealand, US hasn't been doing enough. But I think this has to come, I, I think it boils down to the character of the person or the prime minister. He's making choices um, that will aid and abet his longevity in the office of prime minister. I think it comes down to that. It's not about national security for Solomon Islands. Uh, and also, the, the other thing I think I might add is that we must, Solomon Islands, we must not become the playground for the superpowers. This is very dangerous ground for us. Mr. Wale, I appreciate you giving us your time. Thank you. Thank you very much. When you think of wine, you probably don't think of China, but a new generation of winemakers is fast putting Chinese wine on the map. But can they convince everyday Chinese to drink it? Brendan Wan has the story. Ah, wine. Chardonnay, Sangiovese, Pinot Noir. Excusez-moi, I love them all. Although European in origin, these grape varieties are now grown across the world, even in China. A lot of people just wonder uh, if China produce any wine at all, um, which it does. So China is a wine producing country. That's right, China makes wine, and a fair bit of it too. It still lags behind big producers in Europe and Australia, but it's quickly catching up. The most prominent regions are Ningxia, Shandong, and Yunnan, Hebei. These four are the most, you know, the hot regions in China. Wine actually has a long history in China. It was being produced as far back as 2,000 years ago in Xinjiang. But a lot of today's vineyards are relatively new. And Ningxia province is the rising star of today's wine industry. It's known locally as the Bordeaux of China. Ooh la la. People call it the golden age for Chinese wine. The quality of Chinese wine has been surging over the last decade. I definitely think domestic wines are becoming more popular and that we're seeing more interest in boutique wines. like quality Chinese wines, not just cheap ones. Jim Boyce is a wine writer based in Beijing. This is still a market very much driven by um, gift giving and entertaining when it comes to wine. So for most Chinese people, do you think it's about the foreign labels and the big names? Yes, that's why Penfolds did so well. So number one is overcoming the reputation crisis. Just getting it into people's mouths is the biggest challenge. A challenge Jim is determined to help overcome. But Penfolds isn't doing so well anymore. Australia was once China's biggest supplier of wine, but since the Chinese government slapped tariffs on the stuff, consumers have been forced to look elsewhere. That might help Chinese winemakers. I think there's a pride in Chinese products that it's not just cheap exports anymore, that Chinese products are also high quality and they can start to compete in the world. But probably the biggest problem of all is that most people in China just don't drink that much wine. The average person in France drinks 50 bottles of wine a year. Ah, the French. But the average person in China drinks maybe just a glass or two over 12 months. The potential is there because if it even grows 10%, that's an incredible amount of wine. But as they say, it's about quality over quantity. 
if you're in China and you order Chinese wine, you have the chance of not having a pleasurable experience probably 50% of the time. All right, still a bit of work to do. The biggest challenge is the experience. Winemaking is such a journey and each vintage is not the same as the last. So if you're not making the right decisions in a timely fashion, then you can end up with poor quality wine pretty easily. It's not just a case of following the recipe. Another big challenge is deciding when to harvest your grapes. Too early or too late, and the entire vintage can be jeopardized. But in China, sourcing labor isn't always easy, and growers can be forced to harvest depending on when workers are available. It's not unusual for the farmer to harvest grapes when they think they're ready and deliver them, them to the winery, as opposed to when the winemaker thinks the grapes are ready. And a lot of China's wine is grown in areas with particularly cold winters. People need to bury the vines into the soil to protect the vines because there's freezing. That makes it harder and, and more expensive. So the industry has its challenges, but there are some winemakers starting to make a name for themselves. A lot of these young Chinese winemakers are coming back now from training, working, studying in France, in Australia, in California, and they're bringing their skill back and applying it. Just like Zhang Jing. Jing has traveled the world learning about wine, including a stint at Australia's own Yarra Valley. And now she's an award-winning boutique wine producer in Ningxia. We only produce 60,000 bottles of uh, uh, wine per year. And we grow uh, white uh, varieties, Chardonnay. Uh, for the red is uh, Pinot Noir, uh, Mellow, uh, Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Garnish, and uh, Malbec. Jing's Winery won the International Wine of the Year at the Decanter World Wine Awards in 2011. And that was the uh, uh, first Chinese wine won the uh, highest uh, award in uh, that uh, competition. So after this award, our winery became more famous and also encouraged the Ningxia wine people, enhanced the confidence of the Ningxia wine industry. Hmm, all this wine talk is making me thirsty. I decided I had to try some of China's finest wine for myself, but I needed some extra advice on how to judge it. Think about complexity, think about the length, um, the finish, how long is the finish. It's like talking to a, a wine or interviewing a wine, and you're the interviewer and you're just trying to talk about, you know, what he's been doing. So wine, what have you been doing? Traditional liquors like baiju and beer still make up the lion's share of alcohol consumption in China. But wine is becoming popular amongst China's younger and more cosmopolitan generation. Younger generation are, are drinking more wine uh, because of, uh, you know it's, it's fashionable. People are, are knowing more producers, are, are realizing that Chinese wines can be as good as any of uh, you know, wines from anywhere else. So it's changing. So, Plenty of hope for the future of winemaking in China. Cheers to that. And Brendan Wan joins me now. Brendan, um, I saw you sampling some of the wine there. What Chinese food goes best with a good red? Look, that is a good question. <laughs> and look, I know most people expect me to say that this earthy Cab Sav would go really well with something like a beef bourguignon or carpaccio or something like that. But I like to consider myself as a foodie for the people. And <laughs> that is why I like to say that uh, that Chinese red wine pairs specifically well with a nice bowl of noodles, specifically instant noodles. <laughs> <laughs> cheap red wine and instant noodles. Uh, there Can't you go. go. You're, you're, you're a cheap date. Now, I've also heard that red wine is sometimes marketed as a health product. Yeah, look, I mean, when I found that out, that, I was honestly not surprised because the Chinese love anything to do with health. Like, we will eat that up. I mean, you could say anything like how uh, ginger is good for your... Well, it is, but it's, you know, it's good for the health uh, and good for the chi. Um, and I always say that, like, if you market the product um, as a health product, you'll get your money's worth. Like I can say, my sofa is is got good chi flow. <laughs> so um, yeah, like you can buy, you can market that product as well. And also, I'm trying to get rid of my uh, dining table, so it's got really good chi flow. So please, anyone wants to buy it, come to me. Very healthy for you. And there you go. You're only drinking for medicinal purposes as well. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Brandon. Thank you. Thanks a lot. And that's all for this week. Next week on the show, the epic rise of fast fashion outlets in China. I'm Stan Grant. Have a great night.